Welcome to the Software Engineering Institute's panel discussion on Heartbleed, Analysis, Thoughts, and Actions. Depending on your location, we wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. My name is Rob Flodine, your moderator for this presentation, and I'd like to thank you for your attending. To start, I will introduce the panel, and they will provide an overview of Heartbleed. We will then move deeper into software and cybersecurity aspects, like vulnerabilities in general, secure coding, software process efforts, and incident response. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Will Dortman has been a software vulnerability analyst with the CERT Coordination Center, CERT CC, since 2004. His focus areas include web browser technologies, ActiveX, and fuzzing. Will has discovered thousands of vulnerabilities using a variety of tools and techniques. He is the current author and maintainer of the CERT vulnerability note for Heartbleed. Robert Secord is a senior vulnerability analyst in the CERT division at the Software Engineering Institute, where he leads the Secure Coding Initiative. Robert is the author of the CERT C Secure Coding Standard, the Secure Coding in C and C++, as well as co-author of two other books. Robert is an adjunct professor here at Carnegie Mellon. Christopher Clark, a 22-year veteran of the information technology world, is a security engineer at Codenomicon. Chris utilizes his extensive background and experience to help organizations effectively integrate meaningful security practices into their environments. Brent Kennedy is a member of CERT's cybersecurity assurance team, focusing on penetration testing operations and research. Brent leads an effort that partners with DHS National Cybersecurity Assessments and Technical Services team to develop and execute a program that offers risk and vulnerability assessments to federal, state, and local entities. William Nichols, joined the Software Engineering Institute in 2006 as a senior member of the technical staff and serves as a personal software process, or PSP, instructor for the team software process, TSP, as a mentor coach with the TSP initiative within the software solutions division here at the SEI. Jason McCormick has been with SEI Information Technology Services since 2004 and is currently the manager of network and infrastructure engineering. He oversees data center, network storage, and virtualization services. He also plays a key role in information security policies, practices, and technologies here at the SEI. So to start us off, Will, could you um, give us a, a very high-level overview of the Heartbleed vulnerability and what it is? Sure. Um, the Heartbleed vulnerability is a flaw in a popular cryptographic library called OpenSSL. Uh, and what the flaw is, is it's an information leak vulnerability. And basically what that means is somebody exploiting this particular vulnerability is going to be able to access information that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. Um, from, a, from a very high level, uh, there's a very good way of, of describing how the, the vulnerability actually works. Um, and that is in, actually demonstrated in an XKCD cartoon. Uh, so this is a very simple way of describing what's going on here. And here we've got somebody on the left who's talking to a server. Uh, and the basic functionality that the vulnerability exists in is the heartbeat functionality in OpenSSL and in TLS. And the heartbeat capability is essentially a, a capability that makes sure that the parties involved in the communication are still there. So in this particular case, we've got the person saying, server, are you there? If so, reply, potato. And they specify six letters. And then the server replies, potato. And that works OK. Now they do another heartbeat and say, uh, server, are you still there? If so, reply, bird, four letters. The server replies, bird. And then the person is starting to think here, hmm, wait, I'm specifying the number of letters in the response. So finally here, uh, we've got the attack. Uh, and this is a demonstration of the attack. <clears throat> server, are you there? If so, reply hat. And that's 500 letters. And the server happily accepts that 500 letters as a length of the response. And as you can see in the graphic there, uh, the server does respond with hat. And then it also responds with all of the information that just might be nearby that information. Um, we don't necessarily know what's going to be in that data, but essentially when the attacker uh, uses this Heartbleed vulnerability, they, they're going to get information that they shouldn't see. 
Um, and a lot of that is, is kind of up in the air as to what will be there. But this is the general high-level uh, description of what happens with Heartbleed. Okay. So, Jason, um, next question is for you. So what is different about Heartbleed? Well, I think one of the big primary differences with, with this vulnerability as opposed to what I'll probably wrongly call a traditional software vulnerability is um, the scope that's required for remediating the issue a after you have addressed it. So with many, but not all, traditional software vulnerabilities, you upgrade your software, your code, your firmware, whatever you're talking about, and you've addressed the issue. Sometimes there's, there's damage from that, but not always. In this case, you have a pervasive library that is running all over the world. Uh, it's not really the top level piece of software, so it's not like you're, you're not running OpenSSL for the sake of using OpenSSL. It's, it's a component of a web server, a mail server, something like that. And then beyond that, other than just simply addressing the vulnerability itself, you have to go through and address other things, uh, considerations what might have been taken out of the memory. Uh, you know, a popular one is the encryption key used to secure the transaction. So there's a lot of work that systems administrators and engineers and operators have to do um, that, is a that is important for remediation of this that isn't just simply addressing the vulnerability itself. And I think that makes it it's not unique, but certainly much of a rarer case than what you normally have with, some, with an issue of this kind. Okay. Will, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. Um, so, um, in the vulnerability world, uh, quite often the, the vulnerabilities that people are exploiting, uh, their primary goal is to achieve code execution. Um, if I'm visiting a web page, uh, they have a, a concept called the drive-by download, where I might visit a web page and all of a sudden that particular website, if it's a malicious or a compromised website, that might be able to load malicious software on my system. Uh, so that's kind of the, the general sort of vulnerability that, that uh, people often exploit in the wild, where they are achieving code execution that could cause a crash otherwise. But in this particular case, it is really just leaking information. So it's a little bit unique in that aspect in that um, it's a little bit difficult to determine uh, what might have happened, and there might not be any evidence left behind. So it's, it's, I consider the vulnerability to be unique from the vulnerability perspective in that way, in that it's not a crash, it's not memory corruption, it's just accessing information that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Okay. So thank you for the in intuitive explanation, and, and Jason, thanks for the response to the, the question about why it's different. Uh, Robert, for the coders out there, would you mind uh, walking us through the code that's specifically affected here? Uh, sure. So, so this is the uh, the vulnerable function in the heart lead uh, in the Open SSL. Uh, so, mostly, what's going on here, if you if you if you scan down to the N2S macro, uh, it's reading some uh, data from that's been read over a socket, and taking the the bytes that are uh, are present at, at P uh, and converting them, swapping them, and converting them into an unsigned int payload. So that payload is the size that Will was talking about where uh, give me the word hat and pass me uh, 500 uh, characters of data. So what should normally happen at this point in the code is that there should be a check to make sure that uh, that payload uh, number is uh, no larger than the amount of data that was provided uh, along with that number. And uh, not checking there is a violation of one of our uh, CERT C secure coding rules, int 04C, uh, enforce limits on integer values originating from tainted sources. And, and that is primarily the source of the vulnerability. Uh, what happens then is the code executes uh, a little further down, there's a call to open SSL malloc. Uh, which passes that payload size along with uh, some additional bytes for the header and padding, allocates that storage, that buffers the uh, target buffer to which the data is going to be uh, written. And then a little bit further down in red, you'll see the actual uh, vulnerable code, which is a mem copy. So that mem copy is going to read payload bytes from the buffer pointed to uh, by P1, which is the buffer supplied by the attacker, and copy that into BP. 
So BP has sufficient storage to uh, contain the data, but unfortunately, um, P1 can be uh, smaller than the size specified by payload, in which case you'll have uh, whatever uh, memory happens to be present uh, on the heap uh, copied into that buffer and then transmit it back to the attacker. And that's what causes the information leak that Will was describing. That is a violation of uh, another of our secure code rules, ARR38C, uh, guarantee that library functions not form invalid pointers, which is uh, what memcopy does in this particular case. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving along to how it was detected. Chris, can you provide an overview of how Codenomicon discovered this vulnerability? Definitely. So Codenomicon uh, historically has been an unknown vulnerab vulnerability analysis tool. And what we've seen in the industry is that providing the fuzzing solution for the customer is one aspect. And we looked at what are some of our customers doing from the crypto perspective. And we wanted to determine if that communications path that is established initially is uh, not only secure, but it is strong. So we were adding a capability called Safeguard, which looks at the complete communications path. And that Safeguard capability also performs a limited uh, fuzzing uh, analysis in that initial discussion. So when we started performing the testing, uh, the developers in Finland, they found that one of the immediate responses from, uh, we, we test a multi multitude of different uh, crypto libraries, OpenSSL being one of them, and we saw that OpenSSL, uh, from the fuzzing perspective, was returning a, a value that was exceeding uh, what the actual client side was pushing to the server. And when we saw that, we were seeing we were able to gather information. We won't go into the details of what we saw, but there was a number of different uh, components that we quickly realized was not necessarily what the application should be responding back. And at that point, we took action with uh, the Finland certs. Okay. Um, so then in general, could you speak to how Codenomicon goes about finding vulnerabilities? So as a, our defense tool is a fuzz testing tool. So what we look for is interfaces uh, presented by a device. And it could be a software solution as well, but typically we're, we're looking at device interfaces. And one of those, uh, for instance, might be an OpenSSL open or TLS type connection. And what we would do is fully understand what that protocol is expecting. So we'll generate what's called a generational based fuzz tester, which is our TLS tool. And that generational fuzz tester fully understands how that protocol should communicate. And we're, we take all those different interfaces, break them down to a component level, and then start evaluating each one of those components with uh, uh, invalid data, anomalous data. And what we're looking for is to see if, one, is the device able to handle that um, correctly? And if it's not, how do we provide additional information from that device to uh, help remediate that situation? Okay. I I think I heard fuzz testing twice, so let me follow up with Will. Will, could you briefly, briefly describe what fuzz sure. testing is, and then also talk about, in the general sense, uh, how vulnerabilities are found by possibly other organizations? Sure. Um, so fuzz testing is essentially you are providing unexpected data to some sort of application, and your goal is to look for an anomaly. Um, in a lot of cases with fuzz testing, so at CERT we have a couple of file format fuzzing tools, and essentially what they're looking for are crashes in the target application. Um, now in this particular case of Heartbleed, it's not a crash. So the, the general idea is you're providing unexpected data to an application and you're looking for it to behave in an unexpected way. And um, you can use specialized tools for that. There are general purpose tools. Um, and essentially the, the idea is putting the target application or target software in some sort of situation that it wasn't expecting. Um, and I actually have a pretty good example, a real world example of this, um, that it didn't even involve any sort of software or any sort of tool at all. Uh, but one of the, the bugs that I found uh, happened to occur while I was cleaning my keyboard. And essentially <laughs> I had a command prompt open and I'm wiping off the keyboard uh, and at some point in time, uh, the command prompt crashed. Uh, so upon further investigation, it turns out it's a stack buffer overflow, which is an actually, you know, it's a, it's a pretty commonly uh, seen flaw that allows attackers to do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. 
but the general idea is uh, me cleaning off my keyboard, I'm now providing lots of unexpected data to that application. And then I, the anomaly in this particular case is the crash. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, so fuzz testing is one particular way that you can find vulnerabilities, but there's actually a, a wide spectrum that you can use to, uh, of techniques and tools to find vulnerabilities, uh, starting all the way at the early stages of software development. If you're looking at source code, there are tools, there are techniques that you can use to actually find flaws in software before it's even compiled, before it's even made into something that can run. Um, fuzz testing is an example of dynamic testing in that you've got an application that's already running and you're actually interactively using that system in a way to look for anomalies. Um, other ways that people find bugs, sometimes you can really just look at the specification for something. So even without looking at the code, uh, I might be able to look at a certain RFC or some sort of specification and see, well, wait, they're making an assumption here. And somebody implementing that specification might actually produce vulnerable software. Okay, thank you. So, Brent, next question's for you. Mm -hmm. we, we have an anomaly now, mm -hmm. so then what happens? Right, so kind of the simple nature of the vulnerability kind of allowed for a lot of trivial exploit code. Um, and once the vulnerability became public, you know, we saw a lot of exploit code, exploit code pop up kind of on the internet. Um, a lot of these are kind of derivative of each other. It was kind of people personally releasing their own code. Um, what made them different from each other was really kind of the post-processing, what people were doing with those memory dumps once they got there. Uh, for example, I've used one that, you know, continuously was dumping memory uh, and users can set their own flags. So I was doing a web application. I was setting it on username, setting it on password session. Uh, that kind of just automatically went through those memory dumps for me and pulled out those keys if it could for me. Um, another one kind of went deeper. It would send, you know, millions and millions of, of requests and get, you know, a large memory file. Um, using that memory file, then it would try to do post analysis and try to pull out SSL private keys, which you know is, is a little bit more of more of a threat. Um, so there's a lot of exploits out there. Uh, really, since the code is just modifying you know normal SSL heartbeat behavior, uh, the exploit code is is fairly like I said fairly trivial, uh, and the ease of exploitation is very high and reliable. Um, like I said, by ease of exploitation, I really mean just dumping the memory. Uh, what you do after with that memory is going to be a function of the application that's running as well as kind of the, the host that it's running on. So it sounds like there's definitely proof of concept code out there and that this is, is it, would you say it's trivial to execute against this? It is, I would say, and I can honestly say firsthand, I've, you, know, if, you know, for other customers, I've exploited a web application and it, it is. Um, in this particular case, it was nice because the, the host the web app was running on was not really doing much else. So there was not much else in memory other than the simple web portal login. Um, like I said, if you're you know, bigger organizations that are running huge clusters, there's going to be a lot of things to parse through in that memory. Uh, but it is certainly proven. Okay. So, so next, I'd like to also ask Jason and then Chris what you guys are seeing out there that's going on right now with Heartbleed. So, Jason. Sure. So, I know um, you know from the operational perspective of, of running an IT shop, I know within um, hours of this becoming a public, um, publicly announced vulnerability, um, you know there were some fairly quickly there was some 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 very Basic IDS rules, intrusion detection system rules that cropped up um, that you know you could you could fairly easily imp instrument into your detection system. And uh, within the first 24 hours, we were seeing um, you, we, we were seeing traffic that looked like heart bleed. So from the other side, from the operational perspective, uh, detecting heart bleed traffic can be interesting because what you're essentially looking for is what you believe to be overly large. TLS packets that might be returning memory. You can't, either, you can't just say, oh, well, clearly that's heartbleed. You have a good guess that that's heartbleed. Um, and what we were seeing from the IDS level at that point was essentially um, probes that would come in and try and grab a large, you know, tr try and grab what would, what would appear to be a large um, payload and using the overflow to pull back memory. So we were seeing that within the first day. Um, you know, I, I participate in a couple communities of, of information security people, and I know that that was that was an industry-wide trend. As the as the sample exploits and as um, malicious attackers, especially, rolled this exploit into their toolkit. There's a lot of generic toolkits out there that that the, the people who are looking to exploit use. As this rolled into their tools, 
you just saw more and more of this traffic. So it, I mean, it's it's the, it's an arms race, just like you know, like just about any other software vulnerability. As soon as the adversary is using it, you need to be looking for it and patching it as quickly as possible. Okay. So you said to clarify, you said overly large. Is that 64k? Is that correct? So 64k would be the maximum response. That's correct. It could be up to 64 kilobytes. Okay. Chris. So one of the interesting things that we see from our perspective is that. Um, most of the discussions have revolved around web servers, uh, you know, critical infrastructure type devices, but there's a whole slew of other devices that need to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. We're looking at items that are ubiquitous, cell phones, uh, printers, uh, home routers. Each one of these devices has the potential to have OpenSSL embedded within it. And what we saw uh, immediately after the, re the release uh, are our customers looking for a tool to help determine if their device is actually vulnerable? Um, there are certain instances where that library may be in place, but that portion of the code may be not active in their environment. So uh, we looked at how to address our customer base, and then on top of that, uh, working with core groups to help them provide information of what devices are in their environments that are or should be patched immediately. Chris, that's actually a great transition point. So let's move now out of the introduction, introduction section and move into the responding to Harpley. So I'm actually going to shift over to Jason. Uh, Chris was saying something about uh, the home user systems and understanding if you even have it or not, if you're affected by it. So Jason, let me ask you the, the very specific question. How would I know if I'm running a vulnerable server? Um, well, so that, that, that's one of the things that makes this vulnerability particularly interesting and problematic. Um, there's the standard case where you have, you're using OpenSSL as a library that's part of another system. Popular one is web servers. I think a distinction that's lost in that discussion, I see a lot in the tech press, especially about this is a web server issue, you know, your passwords are vulnerable, that kind of thing. But really, um, this technology is used in a variety of applications, web servers being probably one of the most prevalent uses of it, but by no means the only one. Um, mail servers, SMTP protocol, IMAP protocol, POP3 for mail, um, basically anything where you're doing a uh, SSL connection has the potential for using this code. I mean, the printers, you know, anything like that. Um, this library is baked into all kind of stuff. And it's not just um, the concept of a, of, a, of a Linux or a Unix type operating system. OpenSSL is a cross-platform cross library. You know, a lot of times, you know, you, I've seen um, higher level articles written in, in, again, in tech press about, well, if you're running Windows, you're not vulnerable. If you're running, for example, IIS on Windows that uses the MS Crypto library that, that wasn't in play here, yeah, that's actually correct. But you could be running an application that's a cross-platform application that it has OpenSSL embedded in it because the developers aren't using the crypto library in Windows, for example, in that application. So you really have to know what's running in your environment. You could be running a, you know, an application on Windows that has embedded OpenSSL. And another aspect of this is embedded systems, um, appliance-like systems. Um, you know, there's, you know, IT has really been moving in the last five years, especially to very modular appliance-like solutions. And a lot of those are using a Linux backend, a BSD backend that has, op has OpenSSL embedded into it uh, in its management interface and its application interfaces. So this, 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 is really, um, this is really widespread. You really have to know your environment. And part of the thing um, I think too that's in key here is you know, a lot of the vulnerability scanners, the, the, the software that you can go out and look at what's on your network, um, the, a lot of them have come out with plugins. Um, one of the things that I, when I've talked to other people who have been asking me about this, um, is you know, a lot of them you can go in and say, um, like doing a vulnerability scan across the whole network can be a very time consuming thing, but you can usually narrow it down and say, I want to check only for this one thing. So one of the things I've been recommending to people is get a vulnerability scanner, only run the heart bleed check and go across your network. Even if you have to do something as buy a single license, put it on your laptop and cart it around to your sites or plug it into your different networks um, and just look for that heart bleed thing because you're going to find it in a lot of places you really wouldn't expect. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question that's been submitted. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to follow up right here with you, Jason, on this topic. Um, what is involved in fully patching this vulnerability at every impacted company? Uh, this seems to be a <laughs> gray area at present. <laughs> it is gray area um, because the, the, the gray area comes in in kind of the way I've been looking at this is there's a three-step process. The first step is you have to address the actual security vulnerability itself. 
That is, you have to upgrade either OpenSSL itself, um, you know, if you're running a traditional operating system where you can just do an upgrade of the SSL library, and it's very important that you um, restart all the services, or what I've been recommending to people is actually just reboot the entire server um, to address the actual vulnerability itself. Um, the second thing that we recommend to people um, internally for you know, what we're doing in IT, and I think this is a good practice, is um, the uh, capturing of the private key for uh, SSL. So, so SSL TLS works on a public key infrastructure, so you have a certificate, and then behind that's a private key that's used to encrypt, to protect the data. Um, there's been a lot of proof of concept out there about grabbing the private key out of memory. That's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the big things that adversaries who are going after this is looking for. Um, our position is um, assume the worst that your private key has been taken, um, especially for anything that's, that's public facing on the internet, and, and, you know, and replace those. Um, issue new certificates. A lot of vendors, um, for certificate authority vendors, will actually allow you to replace your certificate uh, at no cost, as long as it's for the same service name and for the same uh, duration. Um, so it takes a lot of effort to do that because you have to essentially generate new key material, generate a new certificate request, send it in, get the certificate back. Um, but that's important. And then the third thing, and this is where the gray part comes in, what do you do then? Um, you know, there's been a lot of recommendations about there about forcing password changes. I think that's a good recommendation. But really, it's a broader scope than that. You have to understand as an organization what's, what, what is on the server or service that you may have been pulling the memory dumps out of to understand what your real damage might be. Because it could be you have few users uh, or maybe you're using some sort of certificate login or you know, something maybe that's not involving passwords but there's a lot of, of, of data on that server that you care about in some other vector, some other fashion. And that's where the gray area comes in. And, and unfortunately for, the, for the, the questioner, I don't have a good answer for that third thing because it's really organizational specific. You know, for a big web hosting company, a lot of times the guidance of, well, change your password is exactly the right thing. But for a larger organization or an enterprise organization, it's, it's a deeper question. It's what is on this system? What does the system interact with? What might have been in memory around, you know, what's, you know, it, I don't you mean to use that term because that's, that's a very hard thing to know, but what is this system doing and what might have been pulled out that isn't just a password? And that's, and unfortunately, that's really a per organization issue that goes far beyond passwords, but then you get into the, the damage equities and how much you need to respond and what you can afford to respond. And, and then that's, that's the very hard question. That, that's one of the things that makes Heartbleed very different and very unique. Okay. There's an additional layer to that that I'd like to add, and that is when these organizations are looking at their environments and they're, they're performing their evaluations, risk mitigation, we're also seeing that industry is not able to keep up as quickly as we would like, especially in the embedded environment. That's great point. Um, ICS controls, some of these other environments are have a much longer lead time. So it's important that the organization take a proactive approach at mitigating that risk, not necessarily at the device, even though they should be looking at that, but also uh, from a barrier perspective, not necessarily from the border, but internally as well. Okay. And, and just to follow up, that, that's a great point, um, and I had that in my notes, um, is like this week I'm still getting announcements from vendors releasing a new version of their software, and a lot of the releases I've seen are for embedded systems, firmware. You know, an appliance vendor that we use um, just released a, an update to their software, and it's you know it's been two weeks, so it's not just a one-day thing where you're going to patch it and 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 then remediate. I mean, you you need to be you need to be looking at this uh, continually. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to add to that? Specifically, the difficulties with implementation of fixing and patching. Or I should say, yeah, correct, I could, actually I, addressing, correcting and addressing the heartbreak. I could comment on that. And, and mostly kind of along the lines of, you know, so why is it here? So Heartbleed came out around April 7th. Why is it right now that we're still seeing vendors producing updates? And one of the things to keep in mind is that consider a very large organization that produces a large array, a large array of products, whether they be software or actually physical devices. And if you were to ask that company, where all do you use this vulnerable version of OpenSSL, it requires them a lot of effort to go through and figure out for all of the products that we have, where is this particular vulnerable library and is, is it accessible? Now at the point where they have to produce an update, they have to make sure they have the build environment set up, they have to be ready to roll out 
fixes. So for any particular large software vendor, uh, it is a very uh, thorough process, and it's a very tedious process mm -hmm. for them to go through and figure out what all is affected. OK. Mm -hmm. So I have another question, Robert, and I, I sort of want to ask you. It came in from the audience. Um, so it's, it's a long question, so let me just kind of break it down. Is open source code being used uh, in production, is that the problem here? Uh, so, so a few years ago, I, I had to go down to um, uh, Washington and talk to the uh, DHS um, um, uh, Homeland Security panel on open source versus proprietary. And w what we told them was that, so they want to know, is proprietary software uh, more secure than open source uh, software the other way around? And what we told them is, uh, you're asking the wrong question. Uh, so uh, neither class of software is necessarily more secure than the other class of software. Uh, people who develop proprietary code argue that uh, you know um, uh, obscurity is a form of security. Most people in the security field don't agree with that. Um, and you know people who argue for open source frequently say, well, you know, many eyes makes the code secure, but uh, you know, unfortunately, those eyes aren't aren't the most trained and expert uh, available. Uh, and and so, uh, so there's, no, there's no fundamental reason why uh, closed source or open source is more secure than the other. What you really want to look at is uh, the quality of the code, you know, the, the, uh, the expertise of the development team, the, the reputation of the code, the history of vulnerabilities in the code base, and uh, kind of form your assessment uh, around that and, and, you know, not whether it's open source or not. Does anyone else want to add to the open source question? Uh, sure. I, I would actually. Um, and, and I have to agree with my colleague here that uh, we see a plethora of devices both using proprietary and, and open source. And really what it boils down to is the quality of code that's being developed. And when we're looking at it from an interface standpoint, we don't do any source code analysis. We, we look at it from a black box perspective. When we test against these interfaces, it's pretty evident to tell the quality of code that's behind it based on the results that we're getting in our testing. And uh, I, I would be um, remiss to say that open source is better than, than uh, proprietary code. Typically what we see is that uh, the proprietary code does not get enough use from our perspective and tends to have some uh, more deep underlying issues if the development process isn't solid. Okay, so you said something interesting about what you're seeing. So let me ask a, a broader question to the entire panel again. Um, is there anything new that you're seeing or unique that you're seeing in response to Heartbleed that you'd like to share besides just the, the patch it and the, the three items that you pointed out, Jason? Anything else, Robert? I guess I'd like to answer that in sort of the negative. Um, okay. In that, um, you know, from a coding perspective, this is not an interesting or unique bug. <laughs> you know, this is... Uh, this is the kind of defect that's been around for a long time. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard to understand uh, how someone working on sort of security critical code like this can uh, be somewhat oblivious to, uh, you know, taking uh, untrusted information, and tr treating it as trusted like they did in this case. Uh, but, um, you know, I think the key to a lot of this is just uh, better educated, uh, better trained software engineers who understand uh, the security implications of the code they're writing and uh, just raise a level of um, uh, awareness as to what, you know, potential issues and attacks might be. Okay. Anyone else? Unique things? Brent? Yeah, and this goes back to kind of some other points we've had, and it goes to that uh, this doesn't just affect web servers. Um, from an attacker perspective, like we said, there's client-side devices uh, that are affected in you know, from an attacker, there's already modules out there that, you know, for client-side stuff where an attacker can set up, you know, their own malicious or, S or SSL TLS server, they can trick someone into using one of those affected client devices to going, connecting their site, you know, think, you know, instant message things, Jabber clients, things like that. And that dumps user memory. So that's dumbing memory from the actual user's machine, not just a server. So I just think it's unique in the fact that it's great to see, uh, you know, the publicity for this. I think it's helping people patch a little bit sooner. But I think we're going to see the effects for for a while, just because of that added client side uh, possibility. Okay, Bill. Yeah. Um, the follow up on uh, Robert's point. 
people do make mistakes. That's what humans do. We're building products. We make mistakes, and we do it at an alarmingly consistent rate. Um, so the education is needed not just so that we can recognize the mistakes we make, but so that our peers, when we're going through the entire development process, can find these mistakes, the kind that we inject, and get them out. So it's not just the individual. It starts with the individual, but it's an entire process that you need to produce the solid code. OK, thank you. Uh, moving back to, to handling vulnerabilities, uh, we'd like to ask you the next question. Uh, specifically, what is CERT's role in dealing with vulnerabilities like this? Sure. Um, CERT and uh, the, the official group that I work for is the CERT Coordination Center at CERT. Uh, and as the name kind of implies, the, the CERT Coordination Center was set up originally uh, after the Morris Worm in 1988 to coordinate vulnerabilities with vendors. Uh, so one of the capabilities that we have is to, if we receive information about a vulnerability, uh, we have the ability to communicate that vulnerability detail uh, among the affected vendors uh, to allow them to go ahead and fix their software hopefully in a, in a less frantic pace as the case as with uh, Heartbleed. Um, so what we end up doing is what, some, of, some of the capabilities that we have are vulnerability coordination, uh, also vulnerability analysis, uh, publication of vulnerability notes, and uh, more recently we've also been getting into aspects of vulnerability discovery where we're actually finding the flaws ourselves uh, as opposed to receiving those vulnerabilities from external parties. And then we're working with the software vendors. Because in the end, our, our goal is to not necessarily find individual bugs. Um, we can find a bug and then help the vendor get that fixed, and that's one fewer bug for attackers to take advantage of. But our goal is to help work with vendors to help them produce better software. And if we have a specific tool that can find a type of vulnerability, uh, we work with the vendors to help them integrate that tool into their process. And the whole goal is to basically help them produce better software. Okay. Um, Chris, I want to ask you then from a general sense, um, can you broaden that out? So we just heard from Will about what CERT does and what CERT's role of vulnerability handling is. Can you give us a sense of what the role of security organizations like Konamicon and others play in responding to vulnerabilities like Heartbleed? Uh, part of the challenge that we run into is we interact with a large group of organizations. And typically when we're performing our testing, uh, we're in an engagement process, um, uh, training them up on how to use our tools as well as part of that training process being evaluating their devices so they have a solid starting point. And from that perspective, um, you know, that's proprietary information. We're, we're going to keep that uh, between us and, and the customer. Uh, but during our testing processes, we are going to find vulnerabilities in pieces of software. And, and historically, Codenomicon has discovered uh, 10, 15 critical uh, vulnerabilities that have been released. And because our point of origin is out of Finland, all those vulnerabilities are percolated up through the, the uh, Finland CERT. And then Finland CERT works with CROSS to get that information distributed to uh, the other certification entities. Okay. So to wrap up the incident response section... Um, what does the overall impact of Heartbleed look like? So let me start by asking that question of Will. What does the overall impact of Heartbleed look like? The overall impact is that, uh, so we've got a security library, a crypto library that is pretty ubiquitous in the, the software world. And the vulnerability is that, uh, like I, I had mentioned earlier, is that Attackers are going to be able to, to access information that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. The impact that I, I think is perhaps what you're asking here is that a lot of vendors have been scrambling over the past few weeks, and not just the vendors, but also the people that use those vendors' products. So the impact is that almost everybody on the Internet is going to be affected by this in some way. Um, and that goes from the people that are running the servers all the way down to the consumers of just being a, an end user uh, who's using a website, who, which might have been affected. 
so it's a pretty it's a pretty broad impact across the entire across the entire internet. Okay. Bill, would you like to follow up with that? Do you have anything to add? Not to that no. one, though. No. Okay, Brent. Yeah, uh, just to build exactly off of that, from like I said, from an attacker's point of view, remote true remote exploits are kind of few and far between, especially you know, today. Um, and to have one like this that, like Will said, affects so much of the internet, uh, you know, that coupled with the complexity, the complexity of you know truly being able to detect um, an attack happening, you know, makes the impact very high. Okay. So next, I want to move to um, reducing vulnerabilities. So we are a research organization, which means we are actively looking at a few ways to tackle this problem. And first, I'd like to start with uh, looking at assured software and then move to secure coding. So, so Bill, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the question I'd like to ask is, uh, how can software be validated or assured to be vulnerability free? Well, we've actually been looking at this uh, recently in a uh, research proposal. And the bad news is we haven't found anything that really indicates absence of vulnerabilities. There are lots of different types of tests we can apply, lots of different static checkers. None of them find everything. And they'll all find different things. So the test can show the presence of vulnerabilities. They really can't show the absence. Uh, let's take an example of something like the Heartbleed. Uh, that OpenSSL uh, module, that, that system is probably about uh, 300,000 lines. Knowing what I know about uh, comparable products, there are probably about 300 defects. What we have found is there's a lot of research suggesting that somewhere between 1 and 10% of those defects are potentially exploitable. So for a product the size of Heartbleed, uh, I can make a guess that it's not unreasonable to expect 10, 15 more vulnerabilities could be lurking in there. Now, the good news, though, is that we have a pretty good idea of how to get the total defect rates down. And if you get the defect rates on Heartbleed down from something like 300 to 30, all of a sudden you've got a pretty good chance of demonstrating there are unlikely to be any vulnerabilities. It gives you much better odds. So let me ask you two clarifying questions. First, you mentioned um, various tests that you could do. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little on that? Well, others are far more expert on the types of tests, but we heard about things like fuzzing. Uh, one of the things that we've applied are a lot of static analysis tools. There are some open source tools. Uh, Robert's organization has tools that look uh, for various types of coding violations uh, for the secure standard. And most of those are just good coding hygiene. Uh, so you have dynamic tools. You have various types of tests. You have static. Your goal should be, shouldn't be to use those to find defects. It should be, by the time you're running those, you want to find that there are no defects. Uh, Herb Brooks said, how do you know you found the last defect? Well, you never found the first. Presuming <laughs> you're really looking hard. Okay. And then you mentioned the defects and vulnerability. Could you briefly uh, describe the relationship between those two terms? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the defect, anything that can cause the, uh, the software to work in a way that it wasn't intended is a defect. Now, those defects aren't necessarily exploitable from a security standpoint. They might cause the program to crash. Uh, although that could be a vulnerability in certain conditions, too. The vulnerability really means that it can be uh, exploited to deny services, to compromise information, and so forth. However, most of, and if you can force the code to behave in a way that's unexpected, some of those could be exploitable. Okay. So your goal really needs to be, just from a general uh, standpoint, reduce the number of defects. Make sure that the code works correctly as designed. And uh, while you're doing it, it'd be a pretty good idea to have some ideas of what are good design characteristics for security as well. Okay, so back to the original question with a follow-up. The original question was, how can software be validated or assured to be vulnerability free? And then the follow-up I wanted to ask on top of that is, what would that take okay. based on what your previous well, answer was? Th the good news for that is uh, we know that pretty good software out in the wild right now is to use, uh, to use K locks, thousands of lines of code, uh, as a normalizing measure. It's not perfect, but it gives you a good sense of the scale. Somewhere around one defect for every thousand lines of code is what people are typically finding in reasonably good software. We know that uh, if you apply diligently some good techniques, um, Robert's organization has some coding standards. If you apply things like those, coding standards, you apply testing at the right places, uh, you train people how to recognize these things, how to review their own work, 
how to, and people have to be trained to inspect other people's work. If you apply these techniques, we have a lot of organizations that are producing software at least ten, with at least 10 times fewer defects per thousand lines of code. So that would take Heartbleed, for example, down to from 300 to 30. At 30, if you're looking at uh, one to five uh, percent of those defects being vulnerabilities, now your chances are much better. And we have other organizations that have produced uh, software that's so solid, you, you just can't find defects. It can be done, and it can be done economically. Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing that there's, uh, it sounds like a process that you have. Could you spend a few minutes in describing the, the process that you would recommend to someone, or yep. instead of recommending to someone in general, could you describe a process that you recommend to someone recently without telling us who? Okay. Well, um, we've worked, for example, with a, a medical devices company. Okay. And the types of things that we introduced were really very standard things. There's really no magic here. There are no silver bullets. Uh, but, you know, if you fire enough lead bullets, you get the same result. So we teach them uh, how to do some basic design. How do you represent a design so that you can think about the problems abstractly? If you're thinking about the design in the code, code tends to be a horrible representation for design. It's very hard to think abstractly at the code level. So think about, uh, teach them how to do some basic things like thinking about state transitions. How do you, rec how do you uh, represent um, operational flow, uh, functional interfaces? Those are all pretty simple. Then in the coding, we teach them how to review their own work. Uh, people make defects, even the most common kind, with a lot of regularity. But you know what? They're pretty consistent. If you know what to look for, uh, if you have checklists, of things to look for in your products, whether it's design or code, you usually can find a pretty good percent of the defects that you injected. Then when one of my peers, like an expert like uh, Robert or Chris, looks at my code, they can look for the really hard things. Now, they can find the really subtle things that I'm not an expert on, and the code becomes even more solid. Now when we get into test, your ideal should be the test should run the first time without fail. And we can do that in a lot of cases. They can actually run the test cases. The test cases then become a statistical validation or verification of your code that you actually did it right. Uh, you're no longer using test as a whack-a-mole to find the defects and fix them. And that's always a losing proposition because uh, even if you're finding them, we have some pretty good data that uh, 10, maybe 15% of all defect fixes break something else. So going off script here, let me ask a question to the panel in general. It might, might be Robert or it might be Bill. I'm not sure which. Uh, I remember fondly my undergraduate days. And I remember whack-a-mole up to about my junior year when I took TSP. Thank you. And uh, that was the first thing they said is that your code should be built and then it should execute. So the question I want to ask is education. I know we're slightly off topic, but it seems relevant based on your answer. Uh, are we still hitting the, the spot on education in the undergraduate programs? Not, not here at CNU necessarily or any specific school. Please don't, don't pick out on anyone. Um, but do you see over the past few years that education is increasing and that our programmers are being educated uh, better? Uh, so I've done some work in this area. I teach uh, secure coding at Carnegie Mellon. And I feel um, you know, like um, I'm able to attack Carnegie Mellon since I work here. <laughs> and, and you know, e even though this is sort of one of the very top schools, there are weaknesses in, in the education program. Um, you know, I follow uh, a system programming course here. Uh, that's a very good course, but it teaches uh, some things which are incorrect and insecure programming concepts. And so students take my course uh, following that, and I have to tell them that last semester some of the things you were taught are wrong, uh, and there are more secure ways to do that. Uh, and I don't see all the students. So the ones who don't come through my course go out into the world without ever uh, learning that. Uh, elsewhere, the situation's worse. Um, you know, I've worked with some um, more uh, regional schools uh, that have um, basically, uh, and, and this is a good concept, it's called it's kind of security injections. Uh, so having a secure coding course in a curriculum is a, is a, is a fail right from the beginning because uh, security shouldn't be separated out as something separate from just learning the code to begin with. And so their goal is to uh, just all their courses to, uh, to try to teach secure coding. And this is a good idea. I mean, don't put bad examples in front of students to begin with. Uh, the problem they have is 
you know, they don't get the top engineering uh, students in the world. Uh, so they get people who are uh, not sure they want to become programmers. And if you put too rigorous material in front of these people, they wind up leaving the program and, and never finishing, uh, you know, with the degree in the programming field. So th there's a range of challenges across the board to improve education. Uh, but we are doing things here at CMU, such as uh, working with the Open Learning Initiative to create online secure coding courses, uh, and you know, providing training to organizations and companies that, that would like to get the training. Uh, we, we've been going on site for um, uh, probably since about 2005. And uh, every time I teach a class, no matter how grizzled uh, veterans of, of programming the, 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 the students are, uh, I always ask them, you know, uh, raise your hand if you learn something new. Uh, and, uh, no, you know, everyone raises their hand every time. So there are, there are still things you learn uh, even after being, a, a, you know, a, a senior programmer for, you know, or programming for a number of years. Okay. Bill, to twist the question slightly for you. Uh, you're going out and you're, you're working with different organizations. Are you seeing that the, the newer programmers or the younger programmers are uh, increasing in their knowledge and secure coding type techniques and standards? Well, <clears throat> yeah, um, I think I'd answer it this way. In, uh, they, I, I think they're still missing a lot of the fundamentals. A lot of the things that would go into secure coding are really very fundamental. Uh, there are certain things that you really have to be especially concerned about in the secure world, but so many of the problems are really fundamental issues in how to produce good code in the first place. Now, people are being taught things like uh, technology and uh, and programming languages and design structures, but they haven't really seen. They don't really seem to be taught how to produce something that works right the first time. It's a difference between the way <coughs> we teach. <coughs> excuse me. A difference in the way we teach uh, software development versus the way we teach some of the engineering. Ironically, some of the engineers are among the worst coders I ever encountered. OK. So Robert, we've been circling secure coding. Would you mind giving us a, a brief, brief overview on what secure coding is and what it means? Sure. So uh, I started uh, the Secure Coding Initiative at CERT back in 2003. Uh, and uh, the, the initial thing we, we came out with was a book called Secure Coding in C and C++. And that really built on sort of 15 years of uh, experience in vulnerability handling within CERT, in which we were seeing uh, the same sort of common errors being made again and again at, at the root, you know, be, being the root cause of many of these vulnerabilities. Uh, so the book uh, seek to sort of enumerate these um, and talk about, you know, how, how do you want to manage dynamic memory uh, in your system? What are the common errors you can make? If you make those errors, how can they be exploited? and what are uh, good mitigation strategies. Uh, that got us involved in, and can, this could be a long answer if I don't be careful here, but um, that got us involved in uh, C standards effort in international uh, standards activities. Uh, and um, that sort of led us to the development of secure coding standards for popular languages like C, Java, C++, Perl, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so most recently, uh, we've begun to, uh, so we have uh, some, some defined secure coding standards that have gone through multiple iterations and uh, hundreds of expert review. And uh, we, we begin to develop something called our, our source code analysis lab, uh, where we use collections of static analysis tools primarily to uh, perform conformance testing of source code against these uh, secure coding standards. And, um, and that's, uh, I guess, a brief overview of the initiative. Okay. So to follow up with that, and thank you for that, um, how can secure coding standards prevent vulnerabilities like Heartbleed? Um, in a couple of ways. And, and the first is sort of adoption, educational. Um, you know, secure coding standards really uh, create a set of requirements for code quality, right? So the first thing you could do is... Uh, if you're acquiring software, you can make it a requirement of your contractor that they should write code that conforms with a coding standard. If you're a developer, you might uh, adopt a coding standard, and organizations like uh, Cisco and Oracle have adopted the CERT coding standards. Uh, and then the next step um, uh, is to then uh, provide some training so that your developers are aware of uh, secure coding rules and um, you know, how to avoid uh, introducing vulnerabilities into their systems. 
the, the next step is um, you know, the adoption of uh, uh, analysis tools. So uh, we've worked with um, the C Standards Committee again to develop a technical specification, a TS17961, uh, which actually uh, provides requirements for conforming analysis tools. So it's a set of insecure coding practices that a conforming analyzer would need to diagnose. Uh, and one of those rules, uh, if it had been enforced properly, would have caught the, uh, the heart bleed vulnerability. Um, so that's, uh, again, sort of a range. So you mentioned a couple things that uh, the audience members should possibly consider. The first one was the standards. The second one was training. And then the third one was analysis tools. So training also wrapped back with education. A few things we talked about seems to be an important uh, theory here, or thrust here. Yep. How is the current training out there? So if, if I ran a small company, I wanted to get some training, would it be easy for me to do? Can I just go down the corner and pick some up? Uh, is this something I would do online? Or is this a comprehensive plan where I need to bring some experts in and, and think about the next few years, how we're going to tackle it? Yeah. So it, it's hard for me to, to, to answer this and appear modest, but uh, <laughs> so, so, so we'll give it a try. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, we have, uh, at CERT, we have really um, probably the, the highest quality secure coding training for C and C++ development. Um, other, other languages and platforms, um, you know, we have some training that we've developed for Java. It's not quite as advanced. Uh, and uh, for other languages, you, you might need to go elsewhere. And, uh, you know, elsewhere, the, the, the quality of the training material available is fairly inconsistent. Uh, so let me, let me cut you off there. So yeah. it sounds less like a plug and more like trying to get to the, the answer I'm looking for. Not that you were plugging it. I, I don't want to apply that. But let's assume that the training is, is good. It's good enough. Is this, is this a, a quick fix issue, or is this a longer term, multiple year solution, say for a, a group that has a programming team of 100 programmers, just to give you an idea of, of what to think about here? Yeah, so, so there, you know, as, as Bill said earlier, there's no silver bullet. And, and, right. and really, to, to get to secure coding, uh, you have to attack uh, every angle of it, right? You need uh, better, better requirements, better specification, better design, you need to develop and adopt secure coding standards. Uh, you need to um, you need to have better trained developers. You need to have code inspections. Uh, you need to uh, start to use analysis early and often in the development process. Uh, you need to have more sophisticated uh, uh, testing. And uh, but you know, I, I I do think a key, you know, the right time to to eliminate a vulnerability is when you're coding, right? I mean, that's the uh, uh, the best the best way to you know the best thing to do is not make the mistake to begin with because downstream um, the mistake is now separated from the guy and the thought process that introduced right. it you're uh, someone else is finding it and you know there's statistics and, and I, God Bill Bill would know statistics better than me but uh, probably eight percent of defect repairs introduce new defects <laughs> uh, so that's also an issue and, and follow up on that. Um, we have a lot of experience with teaching people how to use those types of standards. And the people who do the work, uh, fairly soon after they produce the work, are really in the best position to find and remove the types of defects they commonly inject. And there's nothing new about it. If you ever read Atul Gwandi's book about the checklist manifesto, the technique is really pretty simple. You have a list of, here are the most common things I make. A lot of these defects I never introduced, they don't make my list. But I go through the list, here's my checklist of things I have to worry about, just like the pilot walking around the airplane before taking off. You write it in a way that is meaningful to you. It has to be your own words. You know, what does this type of defect mean to me? How will I know it when I see it? You go through that and you remove a good bit of those defects before they move on. So you should be applying these filters before they go, you let this product go to the next stage. Okay. Chris, did you want to add? Uh, I did want to add to that, and uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit, but there's there's an additional layer that needs to take place, and that is organizational acceptance of security, not necessarily specific to uh, software development, which is what we're definitely focused on today. Uh, but once we move out to the industry, if the organization isn't focused on security, not specifically coding, but as a whole, uh, they're 
there's nowhere to progress to. You know, the developers that are in the field getting a product to market have external factors that are affecting them. Uh, so sometimes there are going to be corners that are taken. So to the discussion of the education process, if it's if secure software development is pushed early, it is much easier for those developers to get into that mode and get that code out the door. Okay, I think that we've we've nailed that that topic. Um, I'm looking at and to get us closer to wrapping up this section of uh, reducing vulnerabilities. I see a couple of the questions that are coming in, and they're mentioning two years and they're mentioning static analysis, and they're mentioning missing this for a period of time. I think, I won't read the question, but it, it kind of hints towards conspiracy theory. So we'll, we'll move away from the conspiracy theory. <laughs> and I'll ask this question, and, and uh, maybe we'll start with um, Chris. So can you speak about the current practices of static analysis and the impact it's had uh, with missing this for two years? Um, well, I, I can't necessarily respond from a static analysis standpoint because we're, we're a dynamic analysis sure. tool. Um, but I, I will say it's not uncommon for these types of vulnerabilities vulnerabilities to be out for that time period. We see it quite often. And, um, you know, to stay away from the conspiracy side of it, really there's other factors that come into play from getting product to market to quality of the developer uh, and lack of tools being used to eliminate those potential vulnerabilities like what we've been discussing. Okay, so before we move to Robert on that, would anyone else like to add? Yeah. Uh a lot of data, about one in every 10 lines of code is going to have some defect in it uh, before, the, uh, before it, uh, the developer finds it or it moves on. So a lot of these things get through. Okay. Yeah, the one comment that I wanted to make is that some people think, you know, it, it's a little bit suspicious that it was, that this bug existed for two years before somebody found it. Um, but that's the case with any sort of vulnerability that is ever discovered in that the vulnerability has always been there, or it was maybe introduced at some point in time with a feature. But when somebody discovers a vulnerability in the wild, that's already in the code. And as for when that was introduced, there's always going to be a delay between when the vulnerability was introduced into the code and somebody actually saw it. Whether that be through actually looking at the code or they did some sort of dynamic testing. There's always going to be a delay there, so and that can be it can be many years. Yeah, there there are some vulnerabilities that have been latent <clears> up to ten years, and and this is one of you know I'm I'm, I'm harping back to training, but uh, the problem with a lot of these vulnerabilities is they are not diagnosed by any tool, uh, and and so in order to you know understand and defeat these, you need to understand you know what the issues are and uh, not produce that secure insecure code to begin with. Um, to answer the the static analysis. Um, there was, a, I think, a fairly massive failure of static analysis to identify uh, the heart bleed vulnerability. Um, I'm pretty familiar with the Coverity analysis. They have, a, they have a program to scan open source programs, and uh, Coverity was uh, not able to detect this. Uh, so the, the main problem they had uh, was the, um, the, the number, number of levels uh, between the input of the tainted uh, input through the socket layer and its use in the function that I, uh, I showed earlier. Actually, if you could throw that function back up, that would be great. Um, so they actually have an arbitrary number of levels okay. uh, that they'll analyze for, and, and it was set too low to catch this particular problem. And that's to address computability um, because, you know, the, most of this static analysis usually, uh, you know, are what we call unsound analysis and that it's not guaranteed to catch uh, everything. And the problem is, in many cases, sound analysis uh, becomes computationally uh, implausible, where it might take uh, billions of years with com uh, current computing power in order to find these problems. So they take shortcuts, and some of those shortcuts prevent them from catching all the defects that might be there. So Coverity has circled back around, and uh, they've, uh, they've written some new analysis so that N2S macro uh, they'll look at that and say, hey, this is a macro which takes byte-swapped information from a network uh, and turns it into an integer, and we should now treat that as a source of tainted data. So once they made that adjustment, uh, newer versions of Coverity will now catch uh, this particular, the heart bleed problem, and they've also caught a bunch of other problems. So, so Bill's, you know, uh, suspicion that their theoretical vulnerabilities are, you know, it's, or theoretical defects is more than that. There are a lot of problems with this code. And I'll, I'll point one other thing out here as well. 
uh, one of the things the open SSL developers did was uh, they've wrapped all their allocation functions. So you see this open SSL mallet call. Uh, now what that does is that actually defeats uh, the existing um, capabilities in the platform to discover um, out of bound reads and writes with dynamic memory. Uh, so they've implemented their own um, uh, allocation layer on top of the existing layer. So there are tools that will find these problems. Uh, and in many cases, the issue is you have to come through and carefully instrument the code and explain to it things like N2S is going to produce a tainted input. And, you know, a lot of times if a developer is doing that, right, saying, hey, this is a tainted input, uh, it's hard to imagine that they're going to have that thought and then not have the thought that, oh, maybe I should check to make sure <laughs> it's within a reasonable bounds. So, you know, that argues both ways, you know, uh, I I instrumenting or, or uh, um, I forget the right word, annotating your code uh, does help you think more about the issues and, and you'll, you'll just find things in the process of annotating, uh, just, just going through that uh, process. Okay. So thank you for that. I'd like to ask one final question of everyone on the panel. Um, so in conclusion, uh, final thoughts on better detecting or prevent, prevention of vulnerabilities? Better detection or prevention of vulnerabilities? Uh, you know, prevention's worth two cures. Is that the expression? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Is there a holistic picture that we should be looking at to, to start the conversation off here? So... I'll, I'll jump in here, and I think it was alluded to earlier, and, and the, the, the comment being that there's no silver bullet. Um, really, for preventing these sorts of flaws, you do need to look at the entire life cycle of from the very beginning, before anybody even begins coding, and you have a certain architecture, and then you've got the actual implementation of, am I, if I'm writing this in C, am I doing it in a, in a secure way? Um, all the way through the point where the software is actually deployed and you've now got some people testing it dynamically, they're doing fuzz testing, uh, but you can't really focus on one particular, it may be obvious, but, but I'll just say that you can't focus on one particular aspect of the whole software development lifecycle and say, I'm going to put my effort here and I think that's going to prevent me from having vulnerabilities. You really need to to look at the grand scheme of things and make sure that you're spending effort in all of those stages. And then it also goes to the point, the comment was made earlier, you have to have an organization that accepts and understands security. And if they want to put some amount of effort into that security, um, it, th through the normal vulnerability coordination that we do at CERT, um, it, it's unfortunate, but there are very few companies that really fully grasp the whole impact of, I really want to do this securely. And uh, it, would, it would help a lot of folks out if, if the companies could really uh, get a better grasp of that. OK. Anyone else want to? I mean, I could second that. You know, there's, there's, there's been <clears throat> some discussion recently with the, uh, the ferry that sank in uh, Korea about the, the lack of a safety culture in the companies that um, that you know built and managed and ran those, and and, and so that's a becomes a cultural issue, right? S software development companies need to to have a security uh, culture, and they need to instill that uh, through all their employees and in in every part of the uh, you know software development and deployment process. Okay. Okay. Sure. Bill, I'll just follow that up with the observation that when uh, when people are under pressure and they have to do it quick and dirty. They only get it half right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Very true. And, and there's a, you know, um, Watts Humphrey um, uh, used to say, and I've, I've always agreed with him, um, uh, you, you know, people, people, I think, sometimes incorrectly think that quality uh, costs more. Mm -hmm. And I think it, in many cases it's, it's the opposite's true. Uh, if you invest in building quality security, um, you know, through your life cycle, uh, it might shift some development costs forward. Uh, but uh, by investing more in, you know, secure design and, and, and quality implementation practices, you can frequently save a lot of money when it comes to uh, testing and 
uh, debugging and, and then patching and fixing. Uh, and certainly when, uh, when you get to security, now the stakes are much higher, right? I mean, there's, um, uh, there's, a, there's a reputation problem when you uh, ship code that has uh, vulnerabilities and puts your customers at risk. Uh, you know, there's uh, now, you know, lawsuits in place against, um, you know, in, in, in the target breach where, uh, you know, people are starting to be held uh, fiscally responsible for, uh, you know, deploying vulnerable systems. And, uh, uh, you know, frequently there can be, um, you know, safety and, and potentially, uh, uh, you know, deaths that can actually result from uh, insecure code. So, so you know, to that point, we, we look at, uh, let's take FDA, for example. There's regulatory organizations that are looking at establishing uh, stricter guidelines for the software development process and the evaluation <coughs> of that product. And typically what we're seeing is uh, a situation where we come in late to the game, where there is a product that's getting ready to roll out, and forward-thinking vendors, uh, what I'll categorize as a buyer, are saying before your product comes into our door, it needs to be evaluated with these tools, X, Y, and Z, our tool being one of them. Well, in those situations, the vendors get themselves, um, or the providers of the product get themselves into a, a quandary of, we've discovered all these vulnerabilities now that we're performing analysis at a later point, uh, and now we've delayed that product release lifecycle for a, a, another customer. So without having th these forward-thinking organizations taking those steps, the general organization that just accepts our products, uh, we, we have to determine, are they accepting that liability or is that going to another source? Does that go back to the manufacturer? That's, that's a question that is probably outside of scope here, but something that will probably be popping up more. So we probably have another minute or two to, to finish this up before we move to the Q&A. So... Final thoughts. I guess the, the comment that I wanted to make, and I think it was already kind of touched on here uh, already, but I, th I think the general idea is uh, the earlier in the software development process that these sorts of flaws are discovered, it's financially, it has less of a financial burden on that vendor. And it takes a little bit of, of uh, understanding for that vendor to, to really grasp that. Uh, but if you consider the consequences of vulnerabilities being found in deployed software, so OpenSSL and Heartbleed is just one example of that happening. Um, but if you look at the impact of what does it cost for the vendor to fix it and now all the people to patch their systems, consider the, the, the alternative of if there were more thorough processes and tools and, and other aspects in place earlier on in the process, uh, you just eliminate that sort of uh, mess that we're that we're in right now, I suppose. Uh, okay. Final thought. The one last thing I wanted to kind of jump in here at the end of this is too is a, from a from an IT perspective, as the consumer of these software services that are being deployed, is I think a lot of organizations need to look at how they treat their software update process and their um, um, like their vulnerability discovery through the use of. Um, vulnerability scanners and things like that. I think a lot of organizations, especially larger organizations, treat change as scary and bad and you know, they have these very large processes to do any sort of change. And I think that those are good for certain kinds of things but bad for other kinds of things. You know, I think that the, the vulnerabilities like this need to force organizations to look at how they do their routine software maintenance. You know, I've long been an advocate of automated software updates whenever possible, and then managing that by exception rather than trying to do this inclusive vetting of all pieces of software before you let them flow down. You know, and how quickly an organization can respond to something like Heartbleed, a lot of times depends on how quickly the organization's organization organizational structures within them can respond to the issue. And I think those, I think there's some attitudes that are historical that I think need to change as software. I mean, I mean, we all know that Internet's pervasive. Software is pervasive. You know, we're getting into the Internet of Things, and everything is connected even more so than it ever was before. I think organizations have to really look at how they manage software change, software updates, um, vulnerability assessment, and understanding what they're running. I think a lot of that has to start changing, especially in, so in large organizations. That's a real interesting point, Jason. Um, and to tie into a question that I, I just uh, saw on the laptop here, and it might go over back over to Robert, though, 
is this is reasonable for operational systems that are day-to-day -day operations. But what about mission critical uh, components? What about systems that are really critical? Uh, you can't necessarily just patch and go. That's true. I, you know, there's you know, there's you know, if you look at it, for, you know, I know for example, like in the federal government space, there's these these categorizations of of availability and reliability and what they would affect if they're down. Um, but a lot of those frameworks define um, how you can go about addressing security vulnerabilities. I mean, there, there's always going to be a trade-off. There's, there's, you know, we've said a couple times now. There's no silver bullet that fixes all of these sure. things. Um, but I think that, you know, when we're deploying engineered systems, software being a big part of those, in the IT world, there has to be an understanding of um, how you will go about addressing these systems. I mean, maybe it's not an automatic patching in the case of a sure. of a ultimate mission critical lives at stake, you know, kind of system. Um, but you know, there has to be a consideration from the deployment end of those software systems about how you go about addressing that life cycle. Um, you know, if you, you could have the best secured code in the world, but when you still have that vulnerability, you have to be able to respond. And I think that's a that, that there's always going to be a tension there between you don't want to take an outage and you don't want to cause Customer damage. You don't want to cause, you know, mission failure. If, you know, if you're in that world, but you know, there's also the, you know, you need to. You also have to respond faster. I think a lot of times than people do, and, and that's always going to be intention. Okay. So, so following up with that, you nope. Okay, um, Robert. Yeah. Wait, but hang on a second. I got a twist I want to add because it was also part of the question. All right. So it's it's not just patching and going, but it's also secure coding. Will secure coding uh, inhibit the ability for mission critical systems? So, if I do secure coding, am I losing something? Am I losing functionality or operational capability? Um, no. Well, okay. You know, not an easy question. Yeah. So, so there, there, there tends to be an inherent uh, trade-off between security and performance, right? So. Uh, not checking bounds is faster than checking bounds. Okay, right. um, uh, and uh, so so we we are very careful in what we do. Like we've proposed a lot of things through the C standards committee, and um, there's a bunch of people who who probably be angry with me after I say this, but uh, their chief concern tends to be performance. Uh, so when we look at uh, security solutions. Uh, the first thing we look at is the overhead of the solution. So if we have a solution that increases runtime overhead by 5%, uh, we abandon that approach because we know there's no possibility of adoption. Um, and so what you'll see um, is maybe solutions that are partial <laughs> uh, but don't have the overhead uh, that, that other solutions have. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's a necessity. So, uh, in order to get it broadly used and adopted, so, so there there are um, there are trade-offs, and different organizations will draw the line in different places. Uh, but you know the the secure coding uh, rules that we create are very uh, surgical. Uh, they're meant to precisely eliminate you know uh, incorrect uh, behaviors, undefined behaviors, without prohibiting. Um, you know, useful coding constructs that uh, might be misused, you know. Uh, so to, to give you a very broad example, right, uh, a safety critical standard like MISRA will say uh, no use of dynamic memory allocation. Uh, you know, there's, this is prone to, uh, well, you know, you don't want to uh, try to allocate memory at 39,000 feet and find out that you're out of memory, right? That's a, that's a bad situation to be in. Um, but uh, in the secure coding standards, we uh, we can't have a large rule like that because there's so many internet connected systems that rely heavily on the memory allocation. So instead, we have you know 30 rules that very precisely define what you can and cannot do with your dynamic memory management, and that that makes it um, uh, it makes it all more challenging. But it lets you build systems that are secure and can perform as well. So let me let me ask this question to follow up with that. Um, we keep talking about things that software developers should be doing. Is there a way you keep making changes to the to the code itself, to the language itself? Well, yeah, we're trying to evolve the languages. We're heavily involved in C standardization, C++ standardization. Um, when you say that, what does that mean? Uh, well, you know, the, the C standards are, a, a C standard, for example, is a continually evolving document. Um, there was a major revision in 2011. 
uh, where we contribute it. Uh, there's an Annex K, which is balanced checked interfaces, which are, are safer replacement functions for, say, normal string library functions um, that introduce an extra argument that tells you the size of the destination array. There's an Annex L for analyzability that CERT uh, help contribute to. So uh, now the problem, however, is that um, you know, C, um, C basically, you know, the run, the, the world basically runs on the C programming language, right? right. And, and, and rule number one is that you don't want to break any existing code. Uh, and so the standards committee is very, very reluctant to move, remove anything uh, from the C standard regardless of how insecure it is. Now, we did, uh, we did um, actually remove the get S function uh, from the C11 standard, which... Uh, for a long time, I never believed that would happen, but it's now, it was deprecated in C99 and removed from C11. Uh, but most everything else is still there. So most of what we do is we add new capabilities which are secure replacements for older, less secure functions, but the, the programmer still has to choose to use the newer uh, secure features and avoid the older insecure features. Because you don't want to break existing code, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, if... if if a C compiler vendor were to strip out, you know, all the stir copy functions, all the, you know, old string library functions, immediately what would happen is, you know, everyone's code would break and they would, you know, complain endlessly to the compiler vendor and the compiler vendor would then reintroduce them. So um, they know they can't, they can't do this. They have, to, they have to make sure that all the existing code continues to, to run. Okay. I have a, a number of really good questions here, but I want to mix it up a little bit. So I want to ask the question that a lot of people might be uh, interested in hearing. Tools. Uh, we've talked about various things that we do, but we haven't mentioned any specific tools. Are there, are there any tools? I'm not asking for you guys to stand up and say this is the best tool in the world, but just if, if you're listening and you're in the audience, what are some of the tools that they should be looking at? Or what are some of the, and if you're not comfortable answering, answering that question, what are some of the things you should be looking at in some of these classes of tools? And of course, we'll well, you know my you answer start. on that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't. Why don't you? Uh, so, uh, my first response would obviously be Defensix. And uh, Defensix, from, from our standpoint, uh, as I indicated before, we tend to get pulled into an environment late in the process cycle. But there's many uh, situations where we can be brought up higher into the software development cycle early on when we're doing component testing and be much more effective. So, by the time that code gets downstream, we've eliminated a good chunk of uh, potential vulnerabilities. But we are one tool in the tool chest. Right, and so not asking you to name a specific tool, I don't want to put you on the spot for that, but what are some of the things you should be considering uh, for those tools in that tool chest? And then we'll open it up to the panel. Well, typically when we're looking at open source, one of the first tools we look at is Valgrind. Uh, that gives us a very uh, uh, useful tool that gives us information about the device because from our perspective, we're a black box environment but we have the ability to reach out to other tools in the development uh, process to incorporate results into our testing. So if we do cause a segmentation fault, uh, we may have the ability, and typically we do, to pull that log information from Valgrind and provide the developer realistic uh, data that they can use to remediate that. Okay, so let's, let's go this way. We've been over here a lot the past 15 <laughs> minutes. Let's go this way. Brent, from an uh, attacking point of view, not to give people advice on how to hack, <laughs> yeah. let's not do that, but um, uh, what are some tools that you were using to do a vulnerability assessment of systems you've had authority to do a vulnerability assessment on? Sure, to yes, and this that. is kind of to build off of what Jason said earlier, and I think a lot of organizations, as we go in and, you know, I won't name, name names of tools, but, you know, they say, well, you know, we're running vulnerability scanners, you know, this, this, and this, and we're using the same tools, and yet we're finding a lot more things and it's because a lot we find out a lot of these security teams and IT teams are shackled, especially in big government organizations, and they're not allowed to be doing the credentialed right. scans, the registry checks, that can find some really low-hanging fruit that they could then, I don't want to say they have to go forward to exploit it themselves, but they could, you know, patch it themselves, and it's easy fixes, things like that. Um, but moving forward to be aggressive, you know, there are open, open source attack tools out there. If you have personnel that are experienced, you know, Metasploit, things like that, I recommend attacking yourself, um, you know, within reason and, you know, within proper permissions, obviously. Um, but that's, you know, one of the best ways. And kind of if you get a third party in there or even just someone else in your company, it gives a different perspective because, you know, a lot of people get tied down on, you know, I know how things work or s supposed to work. Right. And, uh, you know, if you get attacker's perspective there, finding the things, um, you know, that people aren't thinking about. Okay. Bill, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, one thing that a lot of developers could 
easily add into their environments are running some static checkers before they let the, uh, the product move on to later states. Great, static checkers. Is there any, any list of static checkers? No, like I don't have a list of the commercial tools. There are certainly some good ones. I, you can get a free, um, free tool like uh, SonarQ, which is a place to start. Uh, but there are much better tools, and people are much better expert at me at which ones would be applied. I know we have used these in some development environments, and they can be very effective for helping you uh, determine how clean is the code coming in. Are you getting a lot of hits, or are you getting only a few? Okay. Let's keep going, Jason. You know, I, I want to hear tool names. Sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry, but I want to hear tool names. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I know what we use. I, you know, I, I'm not an expert in evaluating every tool class. You know, the one thing I would not. say is uh, to build off what Brent said, um, and this was actually a conversation that him and I had had yesterday and even offline before when we were talking about preparing for this panel, is um, the adversary will gleefully find your vulnerabilities for you as a service. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's really important, I think, that you find tools that allow you to do two things. One is, is, is uh, um, you know, for example, is, is Tenable Nessus allows you, they, they have a differentiation between what they call safe checks and unsafe checks. Okay. Um, you know, I always advocate scanning, even if you're the IT shop, so use the unsafe checks. If you've got to do it off hours, if you have them scheduled, you know, convince your management that that's the right thing to do. Because if you only check the safe checks, you're not going to find the really bad things, right? I, I, and I've had this conversation a lot in, in the different communities that I, that I participate in. And they say, oh, you use the unsafe checks. Yeah, because I want to find it before the adversary finds it. Mm -hmm. And the other point that I, that I can't emphasize enough, and I know a lot of organizations don't do this, is using a vulnerability scanner or some other assessment method that is going off and looking through your network in a credentialed way that can remotely log into your servers and enumerate the software installed there. Um, there's, there's a number of good tools that do that. You can log in and it, and it says, oh, you're missing this, this Red Hat patch and this Windows patch and this Java patch. Um, those are invaluable, especially from the tactical operator level in IT for your systems administrators to know where you're at because inevitably an update process is going to fail. And even if you've, you have an automated patching system, 99 out of 100 machines patched fine, but this one had an error because there's a dependency conflict or this piece is broken or some service wasn't running and you think you've remediated this issue, but when you come along and do your vulnerability scan then you find through a credential, oh, I'm missing OpenSSL 1.0.1G because when I did a yum update, for example, there was this dependency error and it didn't upgrade for me because it's set to just stop. You know, those, those are some really, I think that's a really valuable thing that's very easy to implement. I think all the major vendors who do that kind of tool have that feature. You know, I think that's, that's important. Okay, let's go to Will. Yeah, so we'll I, th I think yeah. the, the general idea that I have is something that I brought up earlier, and, and the, the concept is don't put all of your eggs into one basket. Sure. <laughs> and whether it, is respect, whether it is regarding scanning tools or even fuzzing tools, uh, what we com constantly see are that when people are analyzing this, these different tools, um, there isn't one tool that is going to get you all of the coverage that you need. There's always going to be uh, a tool that uses a different technique. Uh, so the folks at Codonomicon are doing generational fuzzing. Uh, at CERT, we have a couple mutational fuzzing tools. That's not to say that one is better than the other, but basically if you end up doing both, you have the better chance of uh, maximizing your coverage. Give us the name of one of those tools. Oh, so our fuzzing tools on Windows uh, is called FO, and okay. then on Linux and OS X, we've got BFF, and those are basically file uh, mutational fuzzing tools. And give us something that's not CERT. Something that's not CERT. Well, <laughs> so there's a, there's a tool that one of our, our tools is based off of. BFF, at its basic core, uh, uses a utility called Zuff. And that's basically just on the bit level of a particular input, it's going to uh, flip bits. And that's the whole aspect of just changing things around in a way that the application is not expecting it. Okay. Uh, another one that's, that's pretty popular is the Peach Fuzzing Toolkit. Right. Robert? Yeah, so I was going to second the Valgren. Um, you know, uh, dynamic memory bugs are, are, are ubiquitous in C and C++ programming, and they're frequently hard to detect. Um, not using a tool like Valgren or commercial alternatives like Purify 
uh, are almost negligent if you're a C or C++ programmer. Uh, the other thing I recommend, uh, I've talked to, uh, you know, we've consulted with organizations which were going to buy very expensive uh, static analysis tools, but weren't really using their compilers. Uh, so they, they weren't setting, you know, their compiler warning levels to higher uh, warning levels and trying to resolve those issues. Uh, compilers, in many cases, are more effective at finding uh, defects in code than analysis tools because they know specifically which platform you're targeting and, 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 and uh, the details of that uh, target environment. Uh, static analysis tools are great. They should be used widely. There's a range of uh, open source tools. There's a range of commercial tools. Um, static analysis tools tend to have non-overlapping capabilities. So it's actually good to use uh, multiple tools, and, and different tools have different areas of coverages. Uh, CERT offers a service called SCALE, our source code analysis lab, where uh, we'll analyze uh, customer source code using multiple uh, static analysis tools and provide them with the uh, results for them to mitigate. Uh, so you know, there's a there's a lot of tools, and um, you know, you should you should be applying, um, you know everything that's uh, demonstrate to be effective in your environment. Okay, so we, we, we are out of time, but I want to, no, Understood. Chris, I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, the only thing I was going to add is a lot of things we talked about here were uh, related to known vulnerability analysis and configuration management, and those are critical. There is no doubt about that. It's the unknown vulnerabilities are the ones that are going to get you, and that's mm -hmm. really what um, the, the probably one of the core messages we should focus on is trying to evaluate that, find those unknown vulnerabilities before they were released okay. to the public. Good, so first I want to start by saying thank you to um, all of the panelists for participating today. And I want to thank everyone at, uh, well not here, I guess remote uh, for joining us, I was gonna say at home, <laughs> uh, but you might not be at home today. But thank you for joining us nonetheless.